Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Veer Pushpa Gupta. And I am currently working as a doctor in an acute respiratory unit of a major NHS hospital here in the UK. Myself, along with other doctors, nurses, healthcare professionals, and NHS staff, currently make up the front line of fighting this COVID-19 virus. And I join many other health professionals around the world, including scientists and lab researchers who are currently trying to find a way to stop the spread of this global pandemic. So I just want to talk to you a little bit about the COVID-19 virus, give you some latest updates as of the 16th of March 2020. Maybe start off with talking about how this virus originated, how it spread, what are the things that you need to be careful about, and who are the most vulnerable people. And also share with you some of the latest research that is coming out of the cases that we're seeing around the world. The COVID-19 virus is a family of viruses that form the SARS virus. The SARS virus stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Viruses. And if you remember back in 2002, we had a SARS outbreak which originated in Asia and uh, killed a lot of people. This virus is a, a similar virus, but has a tendency of spreading much faster and is definitely more lethal than the previous SARS outbreak that we saw in 2002. How did the SARS COVID-19 virus originate? It's believed to have started in a food market in Wuhan, China where the transmission happened from a bat to an intermediary animal uh, through blood transmission. And the intermediary animal is possibly thought to be a snake, which was then possibly consumed by humans. And uh, the virus transferred from being a zoonotic virus, which was only seen in animals, to now a human virus. And uh, because of the globalization and fast travel, we had the virus that originated in one city in China spread to more than 117 countries around the world in less than a month. Currently, about 160,000 people are infected with this virus. 75,000 of them have recovered completely. 60,000 ongoing cases at the moment, out of which 9% of those cases are serious and critical and require ICU admission, and 2% have been fatal. The highest cases that are being seen are in China, of course, which is nearing about 80 to 90,000 cases. The second highest cases are in Italy, which shows that European transmission has actually caused the curve of this virus to go exponentially up because China, it had actually started to level off after a while. But as the virus spreads across the world, more and more people are getting infected. The curve is starting to uh, rise again. And that is a very dangerous thing for us because as this virus spreads not only in Europe but in North America, this curve will probably rise further and infect more people. So we need to take some drastic measures right now to stop that from happening. The first of which, which is the most important thing that I want to talk to you in today's video, is social isolation and hand washing. These two things alone have known to decrease the spread of this virus in Italy, in South Korea, in Singapore, and even in China. Strict curfews are being employed in certain countries, which limit the exposure of uh, people that are infected to the people that are not infected, and hence limiting the spread of the virus. The important thing that we have to understand here is that health services are in a lot of strain at the moment. We only have 5,000 ventilator beds in ICUs across the UK for a population of 70 million people and 160,000 ICU beds for an entire population of 350 million in the United States. So you can imagine that at some point, doctors are gonna to have to make a choice as to who gets a ventilator and who doesn't. If we can tackle the virus from spreading, we can limit our ICU admissions and hospital admissions. So do your part and be responsible and don't cause this virus to spread any further than it has. Social isolation and hand washing will limit this from happening. What are the main symptoms in patients? The most vulnerable patients that are affected by this virus are those that are immunocompromised. So they can either be either on long-term immunosuppressive therapy, or they could be patients that have been suffering from chronic disease, such as hypertension, diabetes, or patients that are suffering from respiratory disease such as asthma or COPD. Smokers are at an increased risk of serious infection and those patients that have cancer or underlying organ dysfunction can also be susceptible for serious illness. So people with heart failure, people with Crohn's disease and other immuno 
immunocompromised states can have a greater chance of having an ICU admission and being put on a ventilator. At this point, the treatment protocols are pretty much supportive, as we call it in hospital settings. And that means lots of fluids, lots of multivitamins, paracetamol to control the fever. They're the ones that are above 60 years old and have some sort of immunocompromised state. As I mentioned earlier, these patients may require ICU admission and respiratory ventilators to survive. And because of the limitation, we will have to make tough choices going down the line. So everyone should take the responsibility to prevent the spread of this infection so that the vulnerable people are not made to suffer. So how does this virus spread? This virus is a respiratory virus. It spreads via droplets. Once a droplet makes contact with another human being from an infected patient to a non-infected patient, it then spreads the virus in the respiratory tract, mainly affecting your lungs. From the latest studies that have come out of patients in China and Italy, postmortem reports and seeing radiological findings of these patients, we're seeing at the moment, and this may not be understandable for everybody, but the healthcare professionals to note that what we're seeing is a bilateral uh, ground glass opacities on CT scans, pleural thickening of your lungs, a lot of edema, and also consolidation. So a really picture that resembles very severe pneumonia uh, slash pulmonary fibrosis and sort of an ARDS kind of picture, so adult respiratory distress syndrome. And currently we really don't have much information on how things progress or how things improve, but from early studies, it's being noted about 90% of the patients will have non-severe disease, 9% uh, out of which uh, would have severe disease, and then one to 1.5% will die from it. In terms of other symptoms, uh, there are also some reports of heart symptoms being reported. So myocarditis, which means the inflammation of the heart muscle and heart failure secondary to lung failure uh, has been reported as well in certain cases. We don't really have a treatment at this point. A vaccine is in the works. Scientists around the world are working on it at this point, but to spread that vaccine to an extent that general public can get access to it is gonna take months, if not a year, for that to happen. So really, we're not looking at that as a viable option at this point. Uh, yes, it would help if it comes out, but really we need to take the responsibility as, uh, as a society to prevent the spread of this infection. What kind of drugs do you need at home? Well. Immunity is the key, so if you take multivitamins, uh, please continue taking those. It will help to boost your immunity. Vitamin C is known to be a good propellant, and there's, there's a lot of studies on it which say that it doesn't really have an effect, but I think the key here is that we need to take into uh, consideration that anything that helps our immune system and boosts our immunity should be used at this point. Smoking reduces our immunity and it damages our lungs. If you get an infection as a smoker, you are at a higher risk of deterioration with lung disease and then at higher risk of needing an ICU ventilatory bed. So please stop smoking. If you've ever thought of stopping to smoke at any point in life, this would be the right time. Asthmatics and COPD patients are, again, at an increased risk of uh, severe disease. So I would ask all those patients that uh, require inhalers to stock up on their inhalers, either their salbutamol or their salmetrol inhaler. Also patients that require long-term therapy uh, because of their asthma and COPD should have their rescue medications such as rescue antibiotics etc available especially if you're traveling and you're away from your local doctor or your local GP surgery. The hospitals at this point are being overwhelmed with patients coming in so the criteria at this point in the UK and most other Western countries is that if you're showing symptoms of COVID-19 mainly fever, flu-like symptoms so cough, the cough in COVID-19 has been reported as being mostly a dry cough. It doesn't really produce a lot of mucus or sputum. So if you're showing fever, dry cough, pain in your neck uh, while swallowing or a sore throat, and general sort of body pain and muscle pain, these are symptoms that you can get with COVID-19. These are also symptoms that you can get with the flu, but having uh, these symptoms would mean that you are at a risk of getting coronavirus or you could already have it if you've not been tested. So. Testing is a major issue now in most countries because test kits are not easily available. Countries with lower populations, higher economy can order these test kits and give their 
population uh, rapid access to it. But countries that are much bigger and have global healthcare systems or universal healthcare systems rather uh, will have difficulty in obtaining test kits for everybody. So in the UK, we have a shortage at, at the moment of testing kits. We also have a shortage of prophylactic protection equipment. So the criteria at the moment is that you self-isolate yourself for seven to 14 days if you're showing symptoms. If you start to improve, that's great. But if you deteriorate, then you come into the hospital. The only masks that can protect you from COVID-19 are N95 masks or FFP3 masks. Uh, these also will only protect you if they have been fitted properly and you have to go through a fit test to make sure that you are completely fitted and are able to treat patients or be near patients or be near people that have COVID-19. A surgical mask would not protect you from the direct exposure to COVID-19, but it will cause uh, less respiratory droplet spread if you are infected yourself. So if you have symptoms of the flu, or if you feel that you may have the coronavirus, then you should use a surgical mask at all times. You should also self-isolate yourself from vulnerable people in your house. So elderly, and sick people that live with you, uh, you should definitely try and protect them by self-isolation. Does the coronavirus affect kids? Uh, two days ago, we had a newborn that was affected in London, one of the first cases of its kind. We are getting reports that kids are less affected by the coronavirus and they're more vectors of transmission rather than uh, victims. But because they're vectors of transmission and can transmit this virus to vulnerable people, it's important that kids be isolated as well if they show symptoms. And it's important that kids are not sent to schools or nurseries at this point where a spread of this infection can take place and then they can become vectors of the disease. Where are we headed with this entire pandemic at this point? Well, there was a point where things started to level off in Asia because of strict quarantine control by Asian governments, mainly in South Korea and Singapore, Japan and China. But now the curve has gone straight back up again and it's a sort of a linear exponential growth because the disease has spread to Europe and Western countries where quarantine and isolation control cannot be enforced as strictly as in some other countries. Although that is something that doctors and healthcare workers are recommending the government because if people are not going to socially isolate, then we need to start putting strict measures in place so that that happens in order to not burden the health services which are already at a point where it feels like they're not going to be able to cope. As healthcare workers we're getting daily updates on the situation in our region. Our leaves have been cancelled and our rotas are being changed and we are sort of dealing with the situation on a daily basis and new things are happening around the world where scientists are keeping in communication with each other to let them know what findings they see in one cohort of cases as compared to the other. So a lot of data is coming out of Italy, a lot of data is coming out of China where doctors are talking about what kind of criteria was needed uh, before they could decide that a patient needs a ventilator or not and what things help with improvement of the patient's condition. What medications currently are used or being examined to treat this disease? Well, chloroquine is an anti-malarial drug which is being examined as a possible treatment for COVID-19. There are even papers out there that give certain doses that should be administered to healthcare workers at least as a prophylactic treatment. But again, the jury is out there on this. Clinical trials will be needed to really know whether this works or not. But at this point, we don't have the time for that. So not only chloroquine, but also antiretroviral medication, which are used in the treatment of HIV AIDS, are being examined and being studied for possible treatment of COVID-19. So I know some of my colleagues in different countries around the world, like Malaysia, are already using antiretrovirals to treat some of the patients, and they've seen some positive responses. Will the weather stop the spread of COVID-19? COVID-19, yes, is a respiratory virus, and respiratory viruses are usually seen in winter conditions where it's colder, people tend to not go out a lot and stick together uh, quite a bit and thrive in this environment. Once it gets warmer, there is a chance that the spread will decrease. Really, again, I keep stressing this, the main way that we can control the spread. It's been proven now because Italy has started to flatten out the curve since they imposed a strict quarantine. So social isolation and hand washing are the two main things that we need to do to control this COVID-19 virus.